Soft Engineering Radio, episode 131, interview with Tom DeMarco and Peter Hruszka. This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio brings you relevant and detailed discussions and interviews on software engineering topics every 10 days. Thanks to our audience and the partners listed on our website for support. Hello, welcome to another episode of Software Engineering Radio. This is the second episode that has been recorded as a joint SE Radio and OOP session, obviously at OOP 2009. Um, the first one was the uh, Bruce Sam's uh, discussion on security a couple of weeks ago. This discussion is with uh, Tom DeMarco and Peter Rushka about their new book, Adrenaline Junkies. Actually, that's the book is co-authored by all the members of the Atlantic Systems Guild, but uh, those two guys were at OOP and, and, and talked about what the book was all about. Um, we conducted the session as a, a live interview on stage, so there are a couple of uh, audience questions. After the show, Tom told me that he that he liked the format and he did, that he would like to do it again at some point. So I'm sure at some point we'll have Tom DeMarco back, maybe talking about some of his legendary earlier work. As last time, we want to once again thank the organizers of the OOP conference, that's uh, SixData.com and uh, Francis Paulish, the program chair, for taking the risk and trying this SEO Radio live thing on stage and uh, well i guess there were no big complaints <laughs> uh, and again i'm looking forward to your feedback what you think about it as uh, the offline audience now in the podcast okay that's all uh, for the preliminaries let's get on with the interview have fun okay welcome everybody very loud um to this um joint session between the OOP and Software Engineering Radio, the podcast, you might have heard about it. Um, so this session is, is recorded and then broadcast in the podcast later on. That's also why we do it as a discussion, as an interview. And uh, before we... So the last third of the session is intended for you to ask questions. So you might want to think about which, which questions to ask so you have something to ask once we're there. Um, so. The session topic today is about a book, Adrenaline Junkies and Template Zombies, that has been written by Tom DeMarco and uh, Peter Rushka and a couple of other guys who are not here today. Um, and, well, I'm sure you know both of them. They're both members of the Atlantic Systems Guild, written a couple of books, mostly on, well, not so much technical stuff, more about the organizational stuff in projects and in software. And um, that's what we're going to talk about today. So welcome. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you, Marcus. Um, so, well, I already mentioned the book and I've shown it around, right? Yeah. And I'll put it into the show notes for you guys <laughs> listening. <laughs> um, so the book is on behavior patterns, right? And that is a very provocative title, template, zombies, junkies and stuff. So what is it? What is it about? Uh, first of all, for the, the, those of you who are listening via podcast, you're, I'm Tom DeMarco, just so you identify the voice. And, the, right. and I'm Peter Ruschke. Yeah. Um, yes, the, the, the book is about patterns of uh, social behavior, social interaction. Uh, so uh, we, chose, we chose to write about originally 150 different patterns that we identified. Uh, and we uh, ended up with 86 that we thought were good enough, i.e. general enough, to present to, uh, to, the, uh, to our audience. Uh, and of these, we chose two of them to be represented in the title. Uh, we s sort of pre pretended we were going to have an alphabetic presentation of the patterns. Uh, so adrenaline was at the beginning and zombies at the very end. Uh, the adrenaline, I'll start with the first one, the adrenaline junkies. Uh, pattern is, uh, you know it well because your organization very, very likely is, uh, uh, it's, familiar, it's familiar to you because it's the organization uh, where uh, you're not really entirely safe unless you are over busy, unless, you, uh, unless you're acting as though your pants were on fire. Uh, that's an <laughs> adrenaline junkie, someone who is at least acting as though his pants are on fire. 
Uh, and template zombies is uh... template zombies is another kind of person in a project, and they are those persons that believe that you can save a project by filling in templates and templates only. So you have templates for everything, and a successful project is one where all the templates are filled in. Uh, you should have seen such organizations that believe in a totally template-driven approach in there, and so we made them the template zombies. Not that we dislike templates. Templates is a good thing, but you can exaggerate. Uh, Peter has a new template for uh, architecture, so he's not opposed to templates. <laughs> so this sounds like very negative stuff in the sense that it's stuff you shouldn't do, right? So anti-patterns. Um, so is the book only about these negative things or is there also positive behaviors you've identified? Well, we certainly have, we certainly have some of each. Uh, the, the negative patterns are frankly more amusing. Uh, and so we continually struggled with ourselves to limit the number of negative patterns. Uh, but we have, uh, we have uh, succeeded in, in ending up with patterns that are uh, many negative, uh, almost the same number uh, are positive. Uh, and there are some that really are just observations. Mm -hmm. they, they are, we, we don't offer a guess as to whether they're positive or negative. It was surprising, but as, as Tom already said here, the positive patterns are not so exciting. Uh, you see positive behavior and you take it for granted. Yes, that's the way we should do it, and yes, that's what everybody is doing in there. The negative ones are the ones where you discover yourself in a mirror saying, yeah, we're doing such things. We know we shouldn't be doing such things, but nevertheless, we do it. And so we have about, uh, it was surprising, we had about 50% positive and 50% negative patterns in there without counting first. So we simply came up with observations and Yes, we do have good observations in the last 30 years of IT. There is positive <laughs> things out there. If you find yourself laughing over, and we tried to make these uh, interesting and amusing, if you find yourself laughing over one of the patterns, it's almost certainly a negative pattern. Uh, and this is, this is uh, the, 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 the fact that negative things are more amusing than positive is not unique to IT or to social organizations. I'm teaching a course this year uh, at the University of Maine in ethics. Uh, and the subject of ethics it also finds the negatives more amusing than the positives. Uh, for instance, the Norwegian philosopher Kierkegaard uh, wrote a very famous book called Either Or, which is a dialogue between a sensualist and an ethical person. Uh, and even though he was trying to, uh, trying to make the ethical uh, points that the ethical person gives, mm -hmm. the fact of the matter is it's the other guy that's much more interesting. Uh, and today the book is called Either Or, and, and uh, either is the sensualist's part of the dialogue and or is the ethicist's response. And today people don't even read or, they only read <laughs> either. <laughs> It's funny, when I read the book, I, in some cases I really couldn't tell. Uh, and I wasn't sure what that says about me. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, you know, I should recognize bad uh, behavior, but I didn't. Uh, so that's really interesting. So why did you write the book? What, what was the motivation behind it? When we started out working together many years ago, uh, we were a bunch of trainers and consultants uh, traveling around the world in there. And the only thing that held us together was our experience. And so we even made that our slogan in one of our first ads in there, that experience is our only product, because we had no products. We had nothing else to sell out there. Uh, but over the years, the guild always had the feeling we should create something together. And when we have our yearly meetings here, we were always discussing such issues. We had no idea what that product would be. Uh, when we were dreaming about audio tapes or video files and web pages and many, many other things, well, we finally came up with a classic again and we wrote a book. Uh, it's the easiest form. That doesn't mean that we might not present that in different forms in there. But we wanted to have something that joins us together and that somehow captures the experience that we all made. I think also we wanted the experience of doing it. I feel very emotional about the experience of working with uh, five co-authors. Now, if you know people that write, you probably know at least one person who's been part of a two-person team who destroyed a friendship in the process of creating a book. Uh, and uh, we, 
uh, so people look at us and say, you really had six co-authors and you really did write all the patterns together, not just divide them up and one person write one and other, somebody else write another. Uh, we worked very closely on these and it was a, a, a wonderful experience in which we abused each other terribly. <laughs> Uh, but uh, somehow managed to enjoy it enormously at the same time. The book is also probably very necessary in the sense that I haven't seen these kinds of things in other books in that distilled form. So it's not just, well, it's not just to have a product, it's also really useful for people to read. So it's a really good product in that sense, and it's very enjoying to read also. There is a chapter in there from the cutting room floor. So we had many, many more patterns that didn't make it through that quality process. So we had one key author, we had a second, potentially a third co-author for each chapter in there, and it had to go through all the six of us before it got into the book. And as Tom already mentioned, this was a process that wasn't easy. Uh, and so a lot of them uh, fell out of the book and didn't even make it into the last short list in there. We have an interaction method that we use within the guild, and it's called the N-way shout down. <laughs> you shout the other person down and... Uh, but it for, fortunately doesn't... Uh, uh, it worked out fairly evenly. We're all about equal shouters, I think. <laughs> so you mentioned before that you as the guild have this thing that you have this experience. And that's obviously the stuff that went into the book. So from which project, from which kinds of projects, which domains, you know, how long, how many projects, where did you get the experience from, where did you kind of mine the patterns from? Well, you, you have to know the guilt that this is really a very uh, distributed organization. We only see each other at most one week a year. Uh, otherwise, we're all working in different domains, <coughs> in different application areas with different kinds of projects. And we have our specialties in there. For instance, our British colleagues, Suzanne and James Robertson, they are mostly in requirements engineering and they do requirements projects all over the world, some research projects in there. They work a lot in Australia with companies. They work all over Europe and in the US. Steve McMenamin is more on the management side. He's running startup teams, startup companies. He's creating new products in there. So his uh, knowledge comes from building products and shipping them. And, uh, I'm more in the architecture business. Tom and Tim, you do a lot of different things. Different things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, the wonderful thing is people say, we'd love to have you in for a consultant uh, uh, to me. And then they ask this very embarrassing question, what do you what do? You do? And, and I've tried all my life not to be in any particular niche, so I don't have an answer to that. And uh, uh, the uh, so I get few consulting assignments, but the ones I get are, are very interesting because, of course, there's somebody uh, that has a problem that doesn't land in a niche, which uh, makes it amusing. Mm -hmm. So it's across domains, it's across the world, it's, it's many different application areas that we collected them. Uh, even the places that we are living are so far apart that we seldom cross our ways and don't step on our toes in there. See. And from that lot of experience we can of course compare, and that was one of the most important parts during writing that book. Did you see that behavior somewhere else in the world? Did you find another project where that showed up in there? And when it, when it was only the observation of one and nobody could confirm that, it was immediately off the table. So we, we had to see that in different in, domains. In, unless different it was parts. extremely amusing. <laughs> unless it was extremely amusing, yes. <laughs> it, it probably also helps to well, see the differences and commonalities between different cultures over the world. Because you often say, you know, if you, if you work with people from X country, then things are different. But I guess most of that stuff is kind of cross or international or cross-cultural. Mm -hmm. Well, what nobody's saying, of course, is that it also helps that we're very old. Yeah. That we right. have, uh, uh, as we say, 180 years of experience across the six of us, uh, which makes us very old. Right, yeah. So, well, <laughs> see, that's the benefit. You can write the books There it like is, that. there it is. <laughs> so, um, there is no overall structure to the book. It doesn't have, you know, here is five patterns on good behavior in this and that. Why is that, or is there a hidden structure, or? We wanted the book to be a, a good read, where you would pick it up and you would, um, you, the experience of reading it would be optimized. Uh, and so we threw things at you with a, a certain sense of variation. We wanted uh, to keep changing uh, your experience as you read it. Uh, and 
the other more organized approaches we came up with just didn't make for such an interesting reading experience. In fact, during our writing process, we had several categories in our minds, and we even had them categorized, and we'll be discussing very long whether we put them into the book as icons or as uh, annotations, things like that. So we were looking at patterns that simply are individual behavior, in behavior of single persons in there, sometimes in individuals being project managers, other times they being programmers and so on. We looked at team behavior. We looked at organizational behavior. But we also classified along the life cycle. We said, is there something in project planning? Is there something in requirements? Is there something in quality assurance? So we had several categories, and in the end decided to skip them, leave them out, and just present these stories for maximum of reading pleasure, and not categorized by many, many such overall categories. Mm -hmm. But in fact, uh, if you look at these patterns in there, in all of these categories, we found positive behavior and negative behavior and sometimes observations. So uh, in, uh, it's not surprising that uh, we deal a lot with corporate culture, that this is one of the key issues in there. And there is at least six or seven patterns that are positive in corporate culture, and there is many more that are negative in this area. People are laughing, so they notice that there is no positive stuff in the methods and tools. Uh, well, there's only two in the book in this area on methods and tools, so we didn't concentrate on that too much. <laughs> the emphasis. So maybe there is hope. <laughs> maybe there is hope. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so those of you who, oh, by the way, who has read the book? Oh wow! Well, okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. You. <laughs> you see, the others are an opportunity to, to sell the book. To sell. <laughs> um, you probably read other patterns books, and you probably noticed that the, the patterns in this book aren't. You know, they don't look very much like patterns. There isn't a strict form. Now, I, I tend to like this. It reads more like a story, but um, is there any specific reasons why I did that, or how, how come? Well, I, I, Marcus, I, 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 I somewhat disagree with your, uh, with your point. We, we, didn't, we didn't take as our template, we, we didn't act like template zombies, we didn't take as our template uh, the book uh, of, by the Gang of Four on, uh, on software patterns, for example. But we did look very carefully at Christopher Alexander's original book right. called A Pattern Language. And we noticed, for instance, that he had three things for every pattern. He had uh, four things, actually, a name, uh, a picture that represented an iconic picture, a uh, picture that was iconic of the, uh, of the uh, pattern, uh, a pattern description and an essay. Uh, so at least in, in, in one sense, we followed Alexander's approach. Uh, and uh, it, it was interesting. It forced us, for instance, to have a picture. Mm -hmm. And it forced us to give a lot of thought to the name of the pattern uh, and to the, uh, to the very short description of the pattern. In fact, we kept telling ourselves, this is our book. It's interesting. The, the book is the table of contents, in a way. It's the names of the patterns. Yeah. Now, we introduced some other elements as well. We even had a, a quality uh, checking thing in there while writing was that if anybody sees that structure while reading, we failed. Uh, <laughs> so you shouldn't recognize that structure. See, that, that it is point. there. Yeah. And uh, we wanted to hide it in the end to, to, to write an essay with all the elements in there that would be if we had headlines put in between. But we tried to avoid the headlines in between. And it makes it much easier to read than the very strictly structured patterns you sometimes see. And it fits well this kind of soft topic. Right. Okay, so um, one thing you already alluded to before is that the book contains observations. It doesn't say, do this, do this, do that, to, to solve the problem. Why? Uh, well, f first of all, uh, some of the problems are frankly unsolvable. Um, <laughs> Uh, that recognizing them, uh, recognizing your weaknesses, for instance, I'm short, I will forever be short, uh, and uh, fortunately I recognize it, and I don't date tall girls, well, I don't, <laughs> date, I don't date anyone, I'm married, but, uh, but so recognizing yourself is important, uh, but while the patterns may be somewhat general, the solutions are not, uh, so solving the problem within your organization we felt that the best thing we could do is to give you a handle for the pattern, a way to address it, a way to name it, 
uh, a way to describe it. It's why we spent so much time on the names of the patterns. Many of them went through the naming process a dozen times. I think we went through the whole, uh, we kept going back over and over on the names and coming up with a better name. Well, Peter, we'll, we'll show you one pattern a little bit later uh, where we have actually the genealogy of the names uh, and we can tell you a little bit about that. But we had the feeling that if we're successful, uh, that we, somebody would be uh, sitting in a meeting and uh, uh, the, the, the organizer of the meeting would make a presentation uh, to everybody else and somebody would say, sounds like template junkies to me. <laughs> uh, or even better, that's number 43. <laughs> if people have been reading the book, even the numbers could, uh, could become relevant. So what's the pattern with the number 42? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> look it up, look it up. Uh, I do run an interesting experiment when I'm teaching seminars about that book in there because presenting a pattern, I always ask a question, and if you observe it, what would you do about it? And it's really interesting to listen to the answers that are coming up, how manifold they are and how good ideas. And the interesting thing is there are always answers coming up. There's nobody that says, I have no idea how I would react to that. Immediately you have a couple of, of reactions in the audience and they go different ways. And so we think once you recognize a pattern, you are smart enough to find out what to do about it. But you have to give it a name. You have to bring it out into the open. And then it's easy sometimes to find a solution. Sometimes it's very, very hard. We have a couple of patterns. There is no strict answer to that. OK. So then, of course, the next question is, is it IT specific? I mean, if you think about things like adrenaline junkies, I guess that's not necessarily restricted to software projects. Well, our experience base is very largely from the IT industry. So much of the, many of the observations come from that industry. Uh, we're always amazed to find uh, that people from other industries are picking the, the book up. Uh, for instance, nurses. We had, I had some feedback from a group of nurses, teams of nurses that had been reading the book uh, and uh, found some value in it. So it isn't entirely IT specific, but it is specific to domains where people are knowledge workers and where they interact in groups, where the, it's not just individual experience, but it's group experience. We recently received an email from a family therapist in New Zealand <laughs> yeah. telling us that about 60% of our patterns are applicable to her day-to-day -day work. Oh, dear. And we did never plan to make a book for family therapists, so yeah. this was not our target audience in there, so since our experience comes from IT. It also maybe opens up new you know, ways to earn money for family therapists. They could go into software projects and help out. So, <laughs> yeah. so um, we've had this meta discussion about the book for long enough. Now I think we should look at some of the specific patterns to give people and the listening audience um, an idea about some of the you know, examples and some, of, some concrete stuff. So why don't you show us and tell us about a couple of your favorite ones. I was thinking before when we discussed questions here what to pick. And in terms of worldwide financial crisis, uh, we picked two examples that we want to show you. And the first one is one that we called Short Pencil. The, the title Short Pencil comes from the observation made by one of Tim Lister's clients uh, that he hates working uh, for a company where you have to turn in a short pencil before they'll give you a long one back. The cost controls are so strong that, uh, that you have to uh, uh, look out for every penny. We want to uh, we, we're, we're trying to build quality products uh, and the idea of living a non-quality life while you're building a quality product seems like a, a terrible contradiction. So we observe uh, that uh, in some companies they've had successive waves of cost reduction that began to interfere with the, the organization's ability to get work done. They've become so focused on cost uh, that they've lost track of why they're there. Uh, cost reduction can seem like the business you're in. And if it does seem like the business you're in, something is terribly wrong. I again ask a question, what would you do if you live in such a company where you have to turn in a short pencil in order to get a long one? And one of my participants came up with a fantastic answer. Take the long pencil, 
break it into four parts, <laughs> return them, and you're fine for the next <laughs> period yeah. in there. Yeah. <laughs> so you think we are clever enough to overcome that. If, if the company tries to put such limits on us in there, there's always people who find ways to live with that and to, to get over it in there. Well, well, companies that are over an extended period of time really are in the business of reducing their own costs uh, are uh, are in a state that in a human being you would call bulimia. Uh, they are uh, they're becoming anorexic uh, and that is fatal. Uh, it is fatal to the, the company in the long run and to your career in the short run. So uh, if, it's, if it's serious enough, if your company is seriously enough and permanently enough involved in cost reduction, mm -hmm. Uh, then you really probably should be looking to, to be someplace else because it's not good for you. It may be good for it, but not good for you. Before we look at the next pattern, you should start arming yourself, right? You should start asking questions very soon. Here are some microphones. So if you have questions, you might want to start you know, thinking about how to word them. The next pattern. Uh, I picked another one that is mostly true in terms of crisis in there. We do observe that oh, there is no backup for project teams. If somebody drops out, somebody is sick or so, there's nobody to do the work in there. And we call that no bench. A pattern that definitely Bavaria Munich doesn't know. <laughs> because they keep the world best soccer players on the bench. <laughs> and don't even let them out on the field in there. Uh, uh, they can afford to buy the most uh, expensive players and not let them play. But think about your projects. Uh, is there somebody on the bench? Is there somebody that can jump in if something happens in the project? And we find a lot of companies where the bench is totally empty. Uh, speaking in theater terms, not even understudies there that can take the role uh, 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 and nobody really qualified to jump in there. It's a very, very dangerous pattern if you observe that, that your bench is total, totally empty. Well, it, it, it's not dangerous if everything goes well, yeah. <laughs> but uh, if anything goes wrong, like you lose someone, uh, redundancy is the ultimate risk management tool. A little bit of redundancy. I mean, think about um, if you have to be in uh, in New York for a meeting uh, Wednesday morning, uh, you could conceivably leave uh, fairly late on Tuesday and maybe make it if you got to the airport on time, and if your flight was on time, and if the taxi went fast enough, you could probably get to the meeting. Uh, but if the taxi was slow or there's too much traffic, and you're complaining to the taxi driver, well, come on, I need to be there. Uh, you're acting like uh, many IT organizations, uh, when in fact what they should have done was leave the day earlier and, and, and be there a whole day and spend the afternoon shopping in New York and go you know, sleep overnight in a nice hotel and go uh, on time to the meeting the next morning. In other words, you leave yourself a little cushion of something. Well, we're trying, uh, particularly in the IT business and particularly in this economic climate, we're so optimized, we're trying to do everything without any reserve at all. And that almost always means that we end up doing things much more slowly than we could have because we have no reserve to count on when inevitably something goes wrong. Of course, having that reserve is expensive. So what do you do with the people on the bench while they're not primary you know, players? Well, they can be secondary players. Uh, they can, there's always work to do. Uh, they can do extra work. But the key thing is they're overqualified for what they're right, doing. Exactly. You have some people that are overqualified. Yeah. But they also understand that they are serving the role of understudy. Now, why does an understudy accept the role of understudy? It's because of the, the possibility of the moment of glory right. when they are actually uh, up on the stage. Yeah. Okay, now it's your turn. Um, I knew that would happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Linda, go ahead. Hi, thanks for being here, you guys. This is great. I have two comments and a question. Is that all right? Okay. First comment. I'm really happy to see this book because I love patterns. And a lot of people in this room might not know that an early version of people wear one of a great number of books from the Atlantic Systems Guild that's made a tremendous impact. 
on software development, was among the first published sources inside software to mention Christopher Alexander. There's a whole chapter there on Christopher Alexander's patterns. So something I didn't realize until just recently when I went back to look at people wear. Second comment, a lot of the exercises that we do in retrospectives come from family therapy mm -hmm. and are applicable to teams in software development. Interesting. The question, I know that your patterns are different from a lot of other patterns, but the goal has always been in writing patterns uh, to produce a pattern language so that people who were interested in that domain could speak in that language. Now, it sounds like that is happening. Do you notice that that's happening both within your group and your teaching classes so that the people who come out of your classes begin to speak these patterns? Uh, certainly in the, cor the correspondence that we receive, people are speaking in, this, in these terms, but of course that's, they're speaking to us. Uh, I, have, uh, you know, I have had the experience with PeopleWare of sitting next to somebody on an airplane who was reading PeopleWare. I've never had that experience with this book yet, uh, but I think uh, I have great hopes that it will become exactly that. That was our goal as to whether it will actually happen. The book is fairly new. It's been out a year uh, and it's um, uh, I, I think it will have a long life because we're, we're dealing with matters, matters that don't change from day to day. They are the relatively constants uh, of our, uh, our experience and they will be the same for our, a generation behind us I believe. Uh, so I expect it, I hope that that will happen. Uh, Linda, your comment about Christopher Alexander, uh, in all fairness, I, I, the reason so many of us in the IT field uh, are uh, aware of patterns uh, and are aware of Alexander's contribution comes from one man, and that was Ed Yorden. Ed Yorden, very early on, in the early 70s, uh, was holding up a copy of not just a pattern language, but also notes on the synthesis of form by Christopher Alexander and saying, this is it, this is the book, this is the holy book that we need to pattern our behavior upon, our actions, our techniques, and our designs. Uh, and so I owe a personal debt to Ed Yorden uh, from the early 1970s for making uh, a very strong statement that forced all of us uh, and rippled through the IT industry, but it came from one person, and that was Ed Yorden. Did the guy in the plane talk to you then? Did he notice? Well, I did introduce myself. To <laughs> <him>. <laughs> Next question. Okay, first of all, um, I didn't read the book yet, so maybe you've wrote about exactly that already, but I was wondering, when creating the book, did you notice that there's some clustering between the patterns in the sense that uh, if a company is suffering from, let's say, a uh, short pencil, it's most likely also suffering from no bench, so that when I spot one pattern, I might be interested in checking whether other related patterns apply as well. Not really, I would say. We uh, try to more or less make sure that each pattern is found in multiple places in the world, but we did not cross-check whether these companies suffer from other bad behavior or they enjoy other good behavior in there. So I could not confirm that in uh, well, I, 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 clusterings. I, I, Peter, I disagree a little yeah. bit in that when we, when we looked back over, when we started to tell stories to each other, that particularly for the bad patterns, the same companies were involved in many of the stories. <laughs> you know, yeah. So that does suggest a certain clustering of bad patterns. And it would probably be an interesting study. It would be an interesting study in there. Yes, I, I agree, the same names came up all the time in there, but we never mapped it down to the individual pattern level, whether, whether you could really see an influence if one does that, it does also do the other things in there. Uh, it would be a very interesting study, yeah. Well, while we're waiting for um, somebody else, and please, please uh, leap in and give your comments or your questions. I'd be interested more in your comments than your questions, for instance, what patterns are you seeing and what name would you give to them? What is a pattern of your organization that, that you feel needs a name and you might share it with somebody else? We're always interested in that. We're 
we are, are a, a, uh, a collection service for other people's patterns. Uh, but I would mention something about the experience of writing the book. Uh, as I said, it was a very emotional experience. It was one in which we found our friendships getting uh, closer and closer. Uh, I, now, I've had wonderful co-author experience with Tim Lister before. He's a wonderful co-author. Uh, and uh, I, I know uh, a lot about his style, uh, and in particular, his writing style. Tim, his original draft of anything, I don't care what it is, his original draft is only about half as long as it ought to be. The ideas are so thickly clustered in Tim's writing. The wonderful ideas, even the jokes, are so thickly clustered that in reading it through at the normal reading speed, you, you miss half of them. And so I would say to Tim, you need to slow it down, Tim. You need to, to give the person's mind a chance to catch up. And he'd say, well, how do you slow down writing? And I would say, well, you put in fill. You put in meaningless intervals of writing in between the meaningful ones. And he said, are you serious? And I said, yes, now watch, I'll do this. And I would take one of his patterns, one of his essays, and I would interject meaningless commentary, meaningless, to give the, the mind a chance to catch up. And he would look at it and he'd say, okay, I agree, it is better. It is better. So here I'm in the experience of adding meaningless stuff to somebody else's writing. <laughs> and he is such a beautiful human being that he could put up with that and even see the value of it. Um, <laughs> it, was a, it was a very enjoyable experience working with, uh, not just working with the group of six, but working with each individual as we, we worked in pairs for, uh, for part of the process. Um, and we paired up so everybody got to work with everybody else. And all of those experience, I, experiences I treasure. I was exercising at my local gymnasium one day, and I was on a treadmill next to a woman who's a therapist. Uh, and she's, uh, she asked me what I did, and I said, I'm a writer. And then I said, you know, I'm a, I'm a writer, but I haven't written anything for almost a year. She said, why is that? And I said, well... You know, I did this project, and it finished last January, and uh, I've just never been able to pick up another writing project since. And she said, well, tell me a little bit about the writing project you just finished. And I said, oh, there were six of us co-authors, and we interacted in this way and that way. And she said, I know why you haven't been able to write since then. It's because you're going back to writing as a lonely mm -hmm. individual business, and it's just not the same. And it, she's right, it's not the same. Hello, my name is Elizabeth, and thank you very much for writing this book. It seems to me that I definitely have to read it. So you were asking for comments. I'm working with insights, MDI types, or type, well, kind of types, to see how people react, how they influence a project. Are they more the adrenaline junkies fighting for their rights, or they are the leaders keeping everything uh, together and say, okay, we do it that way, we do it that way. And there are 60 types of people, of individual behavior, and so I can help people bridging the gaps within the project. It's another type. Thank you. So, so there, there are, Elizabeth, you're saying there are 60 different identifiable types of individual behavior active in the workplace. Uh, I never heard that exact idea, but I don't doubt that that's true. Did you give them a name? Each one has a name? Uh, eight of them have a name, and the other ones uh, have combinations of, of colors, of different colors. For example, you have a 60% part of the leader part, it's the red one, and you have a 20% part of the yellow one, hey, it's the action, the adrenaline chunky, yeah? yeah. And uh, the other one, I don't know, maybe the blue one, that's the template freak. Uh, and so you can mix them up. Eight of them have a real name, and the other one's more for the psychologists to interpret. Yeah. The book goes a little bit uh, above the classification of persons only. Yeah. We have identified behavior that is not person specific, that is belongs to a certain phase in a yeah. project or a certain activity in a project in there. Mm -hmm. So yes, the two title patterns are person specific, but there's a lot of other behavior in there that is not person specific. It belongs to the whole yeah. team. It belongs to the overall organization. Yeah, so we've I've seen that from your headlines. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. 
Thank you very much. So, is there a relationship to you know things like the disk profile? You know, you know these things like where people are classified. You know, as she says, Myers Briggs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Myers Briggs. Would, would, would you see this is kind of in the same, you know, kind of area? Is it you know? Yeah, understanding these characteristics of personalities in various ways is, of course, a way to expect certain behavior from those people yeah, in yeah, there. Yeah. And yeah. so it is along the same lines, mm -hmm. yes. Well, it, it is and it isn't. Um, one of the things that other classification schemes from psychology uh, have as a characteristic is they come to you along with a person who is determined to push you into a pattern. And our approach has been entirely different. We have, we're, we have no inclination to push you into a pattern, to say you must be this or that. Uh, rather, we're just offering the patterns for you. If you recognize them, then if you recognize yourself in one of these patterns or your organization in one of these patterns, then the pattern is going to be useful to you. And if you don't, you'll just roll your eyes and say, imagine working for a company where this was true. I mean, how crazy. It won't make any sense to you at all. There are no more questions, then I would suggest we look at two more patterns and then we wrap it up. Okay. Well, let's see. Um, let me take the pattern, there is no crying in baseball. It comes from uh, a, uh, it comes from a uh, film that you may have seen called A League of Their Own, about a women's baseball league uh, that has a, a male manager uh, who, uh, when one of the players begins to cry because he's, he's abused her, he says, there's no crying in baseball. I mean, you're not supposed to cry. And, and, and I, we've noticed that, uh, I've noticed that certainly in my own interaction. If somebody begins to become too emotional, there's almost immediately going to be someone that will say, you know, that's not professional. Right. To show that much emotion is not professional. Uh, and uh, that sends a message that caring deeply about things is not emotional. Well, that message is a very negative message because we want people to care desperately about the things they're doing. And, and I think while we're at it, it's also a very anti-female message. It's no surprise that, that women's uh, tears are closer to the surface than men's are. Uh, and so we're sort of saying it's not entirely professional to be a woman, and I, and I know that that idea is one uh, that many of us have felt very comfortable with because we grew up with that uh, in an environment where that seemed to be prevailing wisdom. But we need to work, we need to move beyond it, particularly in a field like IT, which depends for its life blood, life's blood on uh, the very agile and active and uh, useful contribution of our women participants. Um, so the idea that there is no crying in baseball, that the crying, that high, uh, extreme uh, displays of emotion are somehow anti-professional, simply operates against the best interest of your organization. And if you recognize that pattern in yourself, you need to correct it because it's the people that, get, that can get very emotional uh, that are bound to be major contributors. But I warn you in advance, they are a pain to deal with. <laughs> I mean, don't expect it to be entirely easy to deal with people's emotions. One more? One more? Ah, we have three uh, more minutes. We have two. Yeah, five minutes okay. in there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Pick one, we, Peter. We yeah. have a, a couple of patterns in there where the title is really cryptic, and it's not easy to explain what we are talking about. So, for instance, we are teaching the world, even in our English version of the book, a new German word in there, which is Seelenverwandtschaft. So you find that title in the English book and you find it, of course, also in the German book in there. And maybe this is something for the OOP conference here, since you hear a lot about extreme programming here and then uh, about agile teams and so on here. And we found organizations that really have teams in there, Seelenverwandte teams in there, that really ignore every rule of the company. But they are very successful. <laughs> and they throw out software and software. They are not extreme programmers because, as you know, extreme programming is a very strict discipline and you have to follow a lot of rules in there. Uh, but these teams, they simply, they work by sitting together and throwing out software. It's sort of guerrilla teams in there. So um, if you have such guerrilla teams, let them be. 
let them do good work in there. Of course, you cannot uh, put them on the uh, productizing of something and the quality assurance and writing user documentation. So please <laughs> use such teams in an early phase when you want to be innovative, when you need the prototypes in there. And the other observation is you can't form such teams. They either exist or they don't exist. And it's not easy to enter such a team because they have very, very high internal quality standards, but that has nothing to do with the quality standards of your company in there. Uh, they wouldn't accept any member that doesn't fulfill the same kind of quality standards the team has. And so these are, again, teams you can't manage. Right. But if you have them, use them for the best thing well, in there. You excluded extreme programming, but think about the people who invented extreme programming, uh, Kent Beck and his group, when they were first conceiving of uh, of extreme programming, they were a Salem Vivant team. I mean, there was no no other way to see it. Mm -hmm. And in, in this pattern, I guess this is something to, to wrap it up there, we, we came up with a nice pun at the end. Yeah, if you have such a team in there, if you bet you have a thing on such a team, make sure you get Che Guevara and not Che Leino. <laughs> <laughs> the so. German version of, uh, the American version of Harald Schmidt, of course, yeah. <laughs> So, so is, is this project finished? Or are you continuing to collect patterns? Or is there a you know, version two at some point? Or sequel? I, well, I think it, what we're looking at now is the possibility of building a, a book of organizational patterns that would be explicitly steered out beyond the world of IT and would not have any individual patterns in it, but would right. be organizational patterns. Mm -hmm. Just because we, we so enjoyed the process of working together. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we want to turn it around to you in there. If you read those patterns, uh, sure, you find some that, that uh, apply to your organization, some of the good ones, hopefully, and not only the bad ones in there. Send us your patterns. Give us your observations in there. Try to give them names. Bring them out into the open in there. We, we act as a collector for you, and we might include them in future versions. We definitely keep on collecting ourselves in there, but we have no plans at the moment to publish a new book. Okay, then. Tom, Peter, thank, thank, thank you, you very much for being on the show. Thank you, thank you Marcus. <laughs> and thanks for uh, asking questions and, and stuff. Thanks for downloading and listening to Software Engineering Radio. Software Engineering Radio is an educational program brought to you by Hillside Europe. If you want more information about the podcast and all the other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. If you want to support us, you can donate to the SE Radio team via the website. Or you can advertise for SE Radio, for example, by clicking on the Dick, Reddit, Delicious and Slashdot buttons. To contact the team, please send email to team at se-radio.net or if it is specific to an episode, please use the comments facility on the website so other people can react to your comments. This episode of SE Radio as well as all other episodes are licensed under a Creative Commons 2.5 license. Please see the website for details. Thanks to Charlie Crow and the Podsafe Music Network for the music used in this show. The song is called Vegas Hard Rock Shuffle.